Hello and welcome to Sedematica. In this tutorial series, we'll be learning about Linux. So without wasting much time, let's learn Linux. I'm Joseph Sedem, a tutor at Sedematica. We are glad you are learning Linux with us. So in this particular video, we would look at what Linux is and then learn about uh, Linux distributions, what they are and why we have them and then why we need to learn Linux. So what is Linux? Linux is basically an operating system. What do we mean by an operating system? So an operating system is a collection of softwares that manages hardware resources and provides an environment where applications can run. So basically, an, an operating system is a group of softwares, collection of softwares, right? And this group of softwares look for a way to manage, to allocate some device hardware as and when needed. And not only do they manage these hardwares, but then they also provide an environment. So they also make it possible for you to run other software or other programs or other applications while they are still running. So basically that's what an operating system is, right? So the Linux operating system has four main components. That's the kernel, which is basically the core of the Linux operating system. The GNU utilities, it's where GNU starts for GNU's not Linux. The GNU, which is an animal, it's not Linux, it's not Unix, sorry. So the kernel, the GNU utilities, the graphical environment and application software. So basically these are the four main components of the Linux operating system. Now, talking about the history of Linux, we can't talk about the history of Linux without talking about Unix, right? So Unix, so Unix was created by Kenneth Lane Thompson and Dennis Ritchie in 1969 at AT&T Bell Labs. Right, so the two created Unix at that time at Bell Labs. But then the problem with Unix was that it was expensive, right, to run on personal computers, which means that individuals couldn't use Unix, right? They would have to pay huge sums to run or to use Unix. So at that time, Richard Stallman of the Free Software Foundation began a movement. He decided to create or start a project called the GNU project, right? So this project's intention was basically to create a free Unix light operating system. So the main objective is to create an operating system that use, or sorry, that looks like Unix. It behaves like Unix, does everything like Unix, but then it's free, which means that anybody at all which is interested in using such an operating system can use it without paying a dime. So basically that was what Richard Stallman started with. And then he also made the GNU general public license, which would allow its users or the creators to publish their work. Now, around that same time, right, Andrew Tenenbaum and his colleagues, that's in 1987, created Minix. Now Minix, it's also a Unix-like operating system for academic purposes. So it's free to use, but then you use it for academic processes, purposes. But the problem with Minix was that users could not redistribute or modify Minix, which means that you can only use Minix as is. So you can't modify it to your taste or to your liking, right? So that became a problem. And also Minix is... 16-bit architecture could not run properly on Intel's popular 386 designs, which was made for personal computers. So it means that there was a challenge, there was a problem there, right? So around that time, right, around 1990, right, Richard Stallman's GNU project, right, the GNU project had enough software to build a complete operating system. But then the problem now be became or was to get 
something, a program that would unite all these softwares, that would make all these software meaningful run as together. So at that time, they called it a GNU head, right? And the head was designed to replace a Unix kernel. So this head was supposed to be the core of the GNU project, the GNU operating system. But then the GNU head could not perform so well, right? So which made the GNU project incomplete. Now, interestingly, in 1991, Linus Benedict Tovald started a work on the Linux kernel, right? So in 1991, while he was still a student at the University of Helsinki, he started building the Linux kernel. He got a personal computer and then wanted to use Unix. Unix was expensive to use, so he started to build his own kernel. Just, he started it as a hobby, right? But then this was based on Minix and he also used the GNU C compiler, right? So which means that the GNU utilities, the software that were ready, he made use of the C compiler in the development of the Linux kernel. Now the first version of Linux, that was the version 0.01, .01, was released in September 1991. So... That was when he made an announcement. He's beginning, he's starting to build a project out of a hobby, right? As a hobby. And he wants people's views, people's opinion about it. But then, right now, Linux is being built or developed by lots of developers or programmers worldwide. So now we talk about the GNU Linux, right? So Mostly you realize that the Linux kernel is used with other GNU software, the GNU utilities, right, from the GNU project. So most people usually refer to the now Linux operating system as the GNU Linux, right? And even so now, some Linux purists still call the now Linux operating system as GNU Linux. Why? GNU represents the GNU utilities and the Linux referred to the Linux kernel. So you can see the, 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 their view or their point here. So GNU was referring to the GNU utilities and then Linux referred to the Linux kernel. Now, currently about 2% of the Linux kernel is written by Tovart himself, which means that the 98% was built by other developers worldwide, but then Tovards ensures or endorses the codes that would be added to the kernel or the other functionalities that must be added to the kernel before it's been added to the kernel. So basically that's a brief history about the Linux kernel or about Linux. You could read more online or do more research about it. Now, so that was Linux, but then Linux, even though it was free and open source, right? Installation of Linux then was a challenge, was a problem because you would have to get the Linux kernel and also get the, the GNU utilities also installed or also on a different diskette or floppy disk before you install all of them. So if you don't know how to go through the stress or how to handle this, you can't actually have Linux running on your machine. So some group of developers, right, decided to make the installation process easier, faster and better and less stressful. So everybody could use Lin Linux. So these people decided to create various distributions, right? So there were various group of people they decided to make the installation process easier and better. And then these people brought about the various Linux distributions or flavors. So you could either hear distros or flavors. These are talking about the different Linux distributions. But then each Linux distro comprises of the Linux kernel, right? Linux Stovart. Linux kernel and additional software that has the GNU utilities and other softwares. So which means that 
basically each Linux distro is made up of the Linux kernel and additional softwares. So, and each Linux distro has its goal and focus. So there are some distros that focus more on security and pen testing. Others focus more on education, scientific research and others. Others focus more on enterprise staffs and so forth and so on. So the choice or your choice of Linux distribution would greatly depend on the tax at hand. So what you want to do, why you want to use the Linux, then you go and then know the type of distro you need. So some example of Linux distros we have, we have the Ubuntu Linux distribution. So basically you can use it for, for your desktop computers as you, you can use it at home. You can also use it for server or on the server side. And then you can also use it for research and science. We have the Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is commercial which means you have to pay something, but then the source code is free. So which means that the pure source code is free, but the compiled version is what is being sold. So you would have to pay something in order to use it. The desktop, so you can also use it for desktop, uh, on your desktop and then research and science. We have Kali Linux and then the Power. So these distros are more focused on security and pen testing. You have the SUSE. Linux Enterprise Server. It's also commercial and it's used on the server side. We have the CentOS or CentOS, Zorin, Linux Mint, Mancharo, Fedora, and a whole lot. There are lots of Linux distributions, right? So you could visit distrowatch.com for more Linux distros. So if you want to learn more about each Linux distribution, you can go to distrowatch.com to learn about the distributions. Now, why do we have to use Linux? That's the most important question. Why should I use Linux? So Linux is lightweight, which means that it doesn't take much of your storage. So if you have a machine that has low storage capacity, you can install Linux. It wouldn't take much of your storage, right? It's lightweight. It's also free and open source. It's free open source software. So if you want to know What's actually going on on your machine? Once you run the machine, once you open the machine, or you start the machine. It's open source. You can know the, the source, the codes that are involved and what's actually happening. So the information you put on your machine and a whole lot. And it's free. You don't have to pay anything, right, to use it. So that's also another reason why you should use Linux. And then it's fast, which means that your work gets run as fast fast as possible, as soon as possible, you get it very quick. It's portable, it's not cumbersome, it doesn't entail a lot, right? And then it includes many academic staffs and scientific staffs out of the box. So Linux comes with scientific and academic staff and security-wise staffs. So these among a lot of reasons are why you should use Linux, right? And then some people get to shy away from Linux because it has a learning curve, right? So the learning curve means that it takes some time to get used to it and to use its tools. But then you just have to learn and then know how to use these things, right? So but if you learn and then give yourself some time to get yourself conversant or acclimatized to the tools, you would enjoy Linux and Besides, what does it need time for learning? So you'd have to use Linux, that's why. And then, now the question is who should use Linux? Actually, in my opinion, everyone should use Linux, but, but most of all people interested in, or people in the scientific field, right? People who do science stuff should use Linux to prevent some distractions or get their works done as fast as possible. Developers, programmers, and software engineers should also use Linux. And anyone at all who is interested in the free and open source software should also use Linux. So basically anyone at all could use Linux, but it has a learning curve though.
Now, what do you have to expect or what are you to expect from this tutorial series? So basically, we would help you to get started with Linux, which means that we will not teach you everything. Everything, we can't teach you everything about Linux, but then we keep updating you and then releasing videos on how to use Linux and how to use some tools that comes with Linux. We would also expose you to how awesome or beautiful Linux is, right? Which means that you get to fall in love with Linux as well. And then we equip you with the necessary tools that can help you to continue learning Linux with ease on your own. So yeah, basically that's what this tutorial series is going to be about. So be ready for lots of excitement along the way. Now in the next video, we'll be looking at some terminologies involved in using Linux. So if you want to know more about Linux, you need to understand some terms, some keywords that are used or that are associated with the use of Linux. So if you want to know that, then go to the next video and then learn more about that. Thank you very much for joining us in this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and share with your friends and other colleagues to benefit from this tutorial series. Thank you.